Chapter 5, World Stories Now Eric learned that the old woman's name was Nora, for that was what Helma called her, and seemed glad to find her there. She stayed on only long enough to see what Helma had brought in her bundles, and then started out for the farm. Drawing her red cape closely about her this time, and not blowing much as she walked briskly to the gap in the hedge. Once through, she disappeared quickly in the high drifting snow. Hardly had she gone her way when Ivra came from another, jumping the hedge and reaching the door in three bounds. Helma had bought a good deal of thick brown cloth in the village and a strip of brown leather. It was all for Eric. She had noticed his lack of shoes and stockings last night and that his worn clothes were much too poor and thin for winter in the forest. Today, while she sewed for him, he would have to stay in. That was a pity, for it is such fun out in a storm. By night, though, all would be finished. And that is good, exclaimed Ivra, for tonight the tree man has asked us to a party. We're going to roast chestnuts and play games, and there's to be a surprise, too. The tree girl called it all out to me as I passed just now. She put only her head through the door, for the snow came so suddenly it caught her without a single white frock, only a bonnet. But that was pretty. It has five points, like a star, mother. The tree girl said Eric, what a queer name, but how did she know about me to ask me too? Did she ask me? I told her about you, and of course she asked you. You are my playmate. Helma pulled a table to the settle and sat down with all the brown cloth before her, a work basket and shears, but first she measured Eric for his new clothes. You may make the leggings if you want to, she said to Ivra, and when you come to a hard place, tell me and I will help. You may even measure them yourself. We are the only forest people, Eric, who wear anything but white in the winter. Most forest people like to be the color of their world. They often laugh at us, but I like brown. Ivra makes me think of a brown, blown leaf, and now here will be two of them. You can blow together all over the forest. Eric's eyes swam in sudden happy tears, but he only said, Nora wore red. Oh, she's not one of us, laughed Helma, but she's lived close to us so long. She is able to see us. We aren't afraid of her. She's a good neighbor. But why might they be afraid of such a nice old woman? Eric wondered. He was to learn some time and much beside, for this was the beginning of new things for him, and his mother Helma and Ivra were strange people. But how he loved them. Now that we are settled at our work, and nothing to interrupt, what shall it be? asked Helma. She and Ivra were sewing briskly, one in each corner of the settle. Eric was stretched on the floor, looking now into the blaze, and now up at the windows, where the snow tapped and swirled, for today, Helma had said, was to be a rest day for him. It was the first rest day he could remember, and how good it was to know he could lie there with no cans to sort or label for hours, and no Miss Fragg to boss him about when work was over. 
there were to be no more cans for him forever, and no more Miss Frag. Helma had said that quite firmly. He believed her, and was so happy that he trembled, and so, it being true that never again should he go back to that unchildlike life that had frightened him so, and tired him so, all the breaths he drew felt like sighs of relief, and he turned his shaggy little head on his arm, crooked under it, and watched Helma's flying brown fingers with glad eyes. What shall it be? asked Helma. Oh, world stories, please, said Ivra, drawing her feet up under her as she bent over her sewing. Eric probably knows very few of the world stories, said Helma. So sometime I shall have to go back to the beginning and tell them all over for him. And I'll stay and hear them over again, too, cried Ivra, dropping her work to clasp her hands. I love to hear stories over. Why, better than that, you might tell them yourself. Would you like that? Oh, yes, if I can. Do you suppose I can, Mother Helma? I shall begin at the very beginning, way back before men were in the world at all or fairies even. He'd like to hear about the big animals, and you will listen, mother, to see that I get it all right. Now, these world stories of Helma's were wonderful stories, but all true. They began way back when the earth was young. There were stories about the earth itself, how it hung in space and turned, making day and night, when the strange great animals that by and by appeared on the earth and have since gone from it first came into the stories, and then later the floods and glaciers, and at last the first man, any child might have listened with delight and wonder. Ivra had listened so ever since she was a tiny girl, old enough to understand it all and with man, and the wonderful happenings that came along with him. Ivra had begged for the stories day and night, and never could have enough of them. For then, in a great procession, came the stories of cities, <clears throat> and nations of great men and women, of explorations and adventures. They led in turn to stories of languages and writing, of painting and geometry, of music and of life. The names of these things may not promise good stories to you, but that is only because you do not know them as stories. If you could listen to Helma telling them by the fire, or out in the starlight, deep in the wood, or swinging in a treetop, then no other stories you might ever hear would satisfy you quite. So perhaps it is as well you do not know now just where Helma's little house is standing deep in the wood under the snow. Ivra always said that the nicest things about the stories was the interruptions. Helma never minded them, and she answered all the questions Ivra asked. She answered them <clears throat> by making things that Ivor could see with her own eyes, by drawing pictures on the ground or in the ashes, building with earth or snow, playing with wind and water, and in a hundred other ways. Sometimes the answer to a question would take up the playtime of a whole day. But now Eric was to hear his first story, world story or any other kind. Can you imagine how it would feel if today you were to hear the first story of your life? Already asked Helma. <clears throat> the silence in the room said plainer than words that all was ready for the world story. 
This time, it was a story about a man named St. Francis and a story after Eric's own heart. Almost as fast as the story went, the work of Helma's fingers, but Ivra was neither so swift nor so skilled, and the leggings were dropped many times from forgetful hands because all her thoughts were gone away following the story. Yet somehow the leggings got done, and the jacket and trousers got done, and even a little round cap, and all before dusk. For a finishing touch, Helma sewed two soft little brown feathers she had picked up in the snow, one on either side of the cap, which gave Eric, small as they were, and soft as they were, a look of flying. Then nothing remained but the sandals, and because Eric was well rested by then, he was allowed to help at them. They were cut from the strip of brown leather, and Helma showed Eric how to shape them and sew them himself. So after supper he stood attired, all in a brown, a pale, happy child, ready for his first party. Ivra and Eric were to go to the tree men's party alone, for Helma was going far away from the wood to spend the evening with a comrade. It was to be a very long walk for her, for she put on her heaviest sandals and pulled the hood of her cloak up over her hair. She walked with the children as far as Little Pine Hill. It was a low hill, bare of trees, except for a dwarfed pine on the top. In summer the slope was slippery, with the needles of the little pine, but now it was several inches deep in snow. It was bright starlight, and far away, down an avenue of trees, Eric saw <clears throat> shining open fields, and beyond them the lights of the town. There Helma said goodbye. Eric, looking up at her in the starlight, saw her hair like pale firelight under her dark hood, and her eyes so calm and friendly. He clung to her hand for a minute. Have a good time, she told them. Ivra leapt away, and Eric after her. Helma stood watching until the little forms had flickered out of sight among tree shadows. Then she sped down the starlit avenue towards the open fields and the town. Chapter 6 At the Heart of a Tree Ivra and Eric ran until the stars were almost lost to them under the snow roof of the forest. Once Eric stopped to tie his sandal string, which had loosened and was bothering him. Then the stillness of the world startled him. He cried to Ivra to wait, and she came back to his side. Don't be frightened, she comforted. There are forest people near us. <clears throat> they would walk with us, for some of them are going to the party too, but they are afraid of you. That's why they've drawn their white hoods over their heads and keep away. Once we are inside the tree man's though, it'll be all right. They'll come in too and not be afraid any more. But why are they afraid of me? asked Eric, tugging at his sandal string. No one else has ever been afraid of me, even Juno, Miss Freg's cat, who was afraid of most everyone, liked me and jumped into my lap. Why are the forest people afraid? Well, they are forest people, you see, and you are an earth child. Mother and I weren't afraid of you, of course, because we aren't exactly forest people. Ivra paused, and the silence came back. Eric looked up at her. Are you cold? he asked. No, no, but she began to jump up and down and knock her heels together to get warm. Eric still struggled with his lacings. Ivra stopped jumping and went down on her knees 
in the snow to straighten them out for him. Eric's fingers were awkward with knots, and besides, now they were numb with the cold. But Ivra had everything right in a minute. She crossed the strings over his instep and tied them snugly above his ankle almost before he could think. Then they ran on. In starlit spaces, Eric caught glimpses of hurrying figures, so swift and light he could not tell whether they walked or flew. Their cloaks sparkled white in starlight until he was not sure, but they might be star beams and not forest people at all. One suddenly started up just at his elbow and was away like the wind. Ivor began to run and to call after it. Wild star, silly wild star. It's only I, Ivra, and my playmate wait for us. Eric followed her running as fast as he could, but the snow held him back and all the trees in the forest seemed to gather, to stand in his way. Ivra came back to him laughing. They are so afraid of you. <clears throat> no one will come near us until the tree man is there to protect him. Soon they came to a big beech tree, standing in an open space, with smaller beeches making a circle around it. The starlight showed strangely, a narrow door in the trunk. Ivra pushed it open, and Eric followed in after her, wondering at going into a tree. They were on a flight of stairs, lighted by starlight, from a window somewhere high up. At the head of the flight they came to a door, and through the crack beneath, <clears throat> beneath it streamed a warmer light than starlight. Ivra opened the door gaily, and through it with her Eric went to his first party. It was the jolliest room in all the world. The firelight and candlelight did not reach so far as the walls, but left them in soft darkness, so Eric had the feeling that the room was really much too large to be inside of a tree, but in spite of its bigness it was very cozy. The fireplace was in the middle of the floor, just a great hollowed boulder heaped with crackling twigs. The candles, red, green, yellow, brown, and orange, stood circle-wise on a table by which the tree man sat, carving a doll out of a stick. A work basket on the table was overflowing with bright threads and pieces of queer cloth. Eric saw these things because just for a minute he was too shy to look at the people in the room. Almost at once he had to look at the treeman. However, for he came and shook him by the shoulders. Eric had been shaken by the shoulders before, so he shrank away. But this was very different from Miss Fregg's shakings. The treeman was chuckling, not scolding, and the dark eyes that Eric looked up above, the long white beard to find, were friendly and wise. Do not fear us, little earth child, he said. It is we that have cause to fear you. You have only to blink your eyes, pretend to be knowing, and we are nothing. But your eyes are so wide and so clear, we trust you. Ivra told us there was not the tiniest shadow in them, not even the shadow of leaf, only hunger, but we are not afraid of hunger. Come, have a good time at the party. Then the tree girl, the tree man's daughter, came to him. She was shy and shook all her soft brown hair about her cheeks. A circle of little yellow leaves kept her hair from her eyes, which in spite of her bashfulness were steady and kind like her father's. I am glad you are here, she said, for from that minute 
Eric felt at home in the tree. Eric and Ivra were the first of the guests. The others perhaps had been too scared to come, but soon knock after knock sounded at the door, and in flocked the forest people who had been invited. First came the bird fairies, five of them together, merry and good little creatures, as ever lived in the wood. They had arrived only that day from their summer homes in the far north, way up among the snow barrens. They always spent the winter in this wood, living in the empty bird's nests and spending their time making up songs to teach the birds that would come back in the spring. Bird fairies cannot sing a note themselves, nor carry an air, but they make up fine songs for the spring birds, who, while they can sing, with beautiful voices, really have but few ideas. They are fluffy, cuddly, swift little creatures, tiny and quiet. One might think them of little account, just at first, but not for long, for they are the farthest traveled of all the forest people, except the wind creatures only. Now they were fluttering in, and off came their white cloaks, and forth they hopped in bright colors, little feet twinkling and pattering, little wings lifting and wavering. They gathered around the tree man, nestling in a row on his shoulder, running up and down his arms, giving all of the news of their long journey into his ear. He chuckled and chuckled, and soon sat down by the table again, nodding his head with delight at the tales they were telling him. Meanwhile, another group entered, the forest children. The forest children are little girls and boys who live all by themselves in moss houses deep in the thickest of the forest, and know... Nothing of mothers, nurses, or schools. They came tumbling, cheering, and skipping in. Curious bobbing, eyes shining. When their white cloaks were taken off with the help of the tree girl and Ivra, it was plain to see that they had no mothers. Their frocks were torn and stained and half their sandal strings untied and flapping. The tree girl sighed as she patted the bobbing curls into some order, tied the laces, and straightened a buckle here and there. Now the room was musical with sound. The last guest arrived, Wild Star, who had run away from Eric in the forest. He was a wind creature. Wind creatures are growing up girls and boys who live near the edge of the forest. Like all fairies, they can only be seen by earth people on a day that is clearer than a day should be, or by people like Eric who have no shadows in their eyes. Wild Star dropped his bright white cloak as he entered. His wings were purple, the color of early morning high and pointed, but they clapped themselves neatly down his back to avoid the ceiling. He was a beautiful boy, wild and starry, and that is how he got his name. Wind creatures are strong and swift, a little too wide awake, and far traveled to be very intimate with the forest people. But Wild Star, though he was as swift and strong as any, often came to the Tremens, and often played with the forest children in their moss village for days together. He loved the tree man, and now he sat down cross-legged by him, and laid his bright cheek against his knee. So the party began. Chapter 7 Tree Mother and the Drowsy Boat 
let's play hide and go seek cry to the forest children for that is always their favorite game up jumped wild star down fluttered the bird fairies and crowded the forest children and the tree man counted out for them he pointed his finger at each in turn while he said this verse which he made up on the spot sticks are racing in the flood trees are racing in the wood in the treetops winds are racing in the sky tops clouds are chasing in the tree heart snug and warm we hear nothing of the storm when we play at hide and seek it is you must count the sheep at you the finger pointed at eric and it meant that he was to be it put your head here on my knee shut your eyes and count one hundred sheep jumping over a stone wall not too fast explained the tree man while you're counting the others hide anywhere in this room and anywhere on the stairs outdoors is no fair but where are the sheep asked eric and how can i count them with my eyes shut every one suddenly looked puzzled the forest children's eyes grew wide and wondering the bird fairies fluttered uneasily the tree girl seemed dazed wild star said why we never thought of that where are they but ivra laughed and ran to eric she took his hand and said the sheep are inside your own head just shut your eyes and try to see them it is very easy the wall is low and there's a place where the stones are beginning to roll down the sheep go over there one by one eric shut his eyes and put his head down on the tree men's knee and it began to happen just as ivra had said there was a green hill pasture a little gray stone wall slanting across it and sheep one by one jumping where the wall was broken down following their leader he counted one hundred of them and then stopped although a dear little lamb was trotting down the hill trailing the procession he wanted to see if the lamb would be able to jump the wall too but the tree man had said one hundred so he stopped and opened his eyes things were strange the tree man was nothing but an old stump the room felt very cold and it was bare the fire in the boulder had gone out but he heard a soft fluttering somewhere and took heart the bird fairies they might be hiding high having wings he went all around the room looking up into the dusk at last there they were in a row on a beam their wings spread over their eyes bird fairies i spy cried eric and ran towards the stump but wings are swifter than feet and the bird fairies reached the goal first he found ivra at the top of the second flight of stairs curled up in a shadow i spy and he ran just as fast as he could down the stairs he was ahead of her to the door and thought he would surely win but she passed him in the room and touched the stump first the tree girl of all places was kneeling behind the stump of course she touched it the minute eric spied her and so she was safe the forest children were hiding some in the hall behind the door some on the stairs one under the table and every one of them beat him to the goal and touched it first now there's only wild star ivra cried you must catch him eric or else you'll have to be it again wild star was outside up in the top of the tree in the starlight 
Eric discovered him by seeing one of the tips of his purple wings, which was caught in a crack of the sky door. I spy, he called, and pulled the wing tip to let Wildstar know he was found. But, of course, Wildstar passed him like a flash, his strong wings beating down. Tears of vexation welled in Eric's eyes. One thing he had gained, though, because he had found them all, even though he could not run so fast as they. The treemen had come back and sat there in the place of the stump, and all was warm and bright again. The treeman had only wanted to prove for himself that Eric could see Wild Star, the bird fairies, and the others without Ivra to point them out to him. But he felt satisfied now that Eric's eyes were really clear, and that he would never hurt any of them by looking through them or pretending they did not exist. Wild Star is it now, he said, for he didn't play fair, going outside like that. Oh, I forgot, outside was no fair, cried Wild Star, laughing. So this time Eric hid with the others, while Wild Star counted sheep. He ran wildly all round the room, trying to find a hiding place, but everywhere there was someone ahead of him. At last he came back to the treeman himself, with Wild Star counting sheep at his knee. Ninety-five, ninety-six, ninety-seven, counted Wild Star. Oh dear, oh dear, Eric whispered to himself in despair. Ivra was hiding behind the tree men, and so she jumped out and pulled Eric back to hide with her. Ninety-eight, ninety-nine, one hundred. Wild Star started up, and never thinking to look behind the tree man, went circling the room in swift flight. He saw Ivra and Eric as he flew over their heads, of course, and they laughed and touched the tree man first, but he caught most of the others, even the forest children who are so swift and clever. After that, Almost everyone had to take his turn at being it. When the merry game came to an end at last, they gathered around the boulder fireplace. The twigs were glowing embers now and looked like myriads of golden flower buds. Then the forest children began clamoring, for a world story. So Ivra climbed up on the treeman's knee and, tipping her head back against his chest, looked into the fire and told one of Helma's world stories. It was the story of a glacier. That may not sound like a very interesting story to you, but if you could hear Ivra tell it in all its wonder, just as Helma had told it to her, you would never ask for a better story. No, you would ask for that one over and over again, as the forest children did the minute she was through. But instead of telling that one over, Ivra told another, a little story about some eggs and a brood of chickens, and they wanted that over. But there must be an end to everything, and so the tree girl brought out a bowl of beech nuts, and they forgot the stories, and ate as much as they wanted. There were apples, too, big and red and cold-cheeked. Everyone was hungry. When all were satisfied, there was sudden whispering among the guests. The bird fairies fluttered and hummed with excitement. The forest children's eyes began to shine expectantly. Ivra, who still sat on the tree man's knee, spoke what they were all thinking. The surprise, she said to the tree man, 
You know you promised us a surprise tonight. Is it time for it yet? Yes, said the tree man. It is high time. Come, put on your cloaks. It's a cold night. But the surprise, they all cried at once. We don't want to go home until we have had the surprise. Oh, the surprise is up in the branches. My mother is there with her airboat, waiting to take you all home. The forest children clapped their hands and jumped up and down until their sandal laces that were not already loose and flapping came undone and flapped too. Wild Star sprang towards the stairs, his face alight. Ivra slipped down from the tree man's knee and ran to Eric. The tree mother, the dear beautiful tree mother, we are to see her and ride with her, she cried. Then she dashed away for her cloak. The forest children, with the tree girl's help, were tumbling into theirs, wrong end to mostly ripping off buckles in their hurry. The tree mother, the dear tree mother, their little teeth chattered in ecstasy. When all were ready, they crowded up the straight starlit stairs. At the top, they crawled out through the sky door, one by one, into the branches. Eric followed Ivra and saw a great black moth-like thing poised in air by the tree's top. But it was hollowed like a boat, and a shadowy woman was standing upright in it. A dark cloak covered her, but the hood had fallen back, and her face in the starlight was very beautiful and very young, younger even than Helma's, whose face Eric had thought all that day too young and glad to be a mother's. How could this be the tree man's mother? He wondered, the tree girl's grandmother. Then he saw that her hair was white, whiter than all the snow that lay in the forest. It was very cold, kneeling there and clinging in the tip of the great beech tree. The forest below was still and dark, but the air and the wintry star-filled sky were bright with a blue cold light. After the warmth at the heart of the tree, <clears throat> the cold was almost unbearable. Eric longed to wave his arms about and jump up and down to get warm, but he had to cling <clears throat> still and motionless to the branches to keep from falling. At last, Ivra whispered, It's our turn now, and taking Eric's hand, she made him jump with her right out into cold space. For one awful instant, he thought they were both falling down, down to the ground, but they had only dropped into the airboat. The tree mother leaned forward and pulled a blanket over them. Her eyes, as she did it, looked straight into Eric's. They were dark and deep as the forest shadows. He began to speak to tell her who he was for her look was questioning, but she put her finger to her lips. Then he noticed for the first time that every one was silent, even the tree man and his daughter, who stood in the treetop waving. Goodbye spoke no words, only nodded and waved. The last bird fairy fluttered noiselessly in. Eric lay back under the warm blanket, snuggled against Ivra, a bird fairy nestled into the palm of each of his hands. All was still and warm. The airboat slipped away high and higher over the tree tops and on and on. On a cold, starlit night nestled 
in feathery warmth to sail over the dark treetops, high and higher and on and on. That is a wonderful thing, and when the tree mother stands above you, wrapped in her dark cloak, with her face shining under her cloudy white hair, now and then bending to tuck the blanket more snugly about you, what could be more blissful? Very soon Eric became drowsy against his will. His eyelids dropped like curtains shutting out the stars. But he roused when the boat stopped, hovered and sank down like a bird until it rested on the crusted snow in the middle of a tiny village of tiny moss houses. Only now, of course, the houses were covered with snow and looked like baby Eskimo huts. The forest children crept sleepily out of the boat, kissing the tree mother goodbye as though in a dream. Not a word was spoken. There was the creak of their little feet on the cold snow. That was all. Each child went alone into his little house. They were lighted and looked warm through the doors. The tree mother nodded as though that were well, but before the airboat had risen out of sight, the lights were all out, and the forest children sound asleep, snuggled into their moss beds. From then on stops were frequent, and Eric woke at each one. At every bird fairy nest at which they stopped, the tree mother leaned from the boat and scooped the crusted snow out of the nest. Then, when the bird fairy was settled down, she powdered the snow with her fingers until it was soft and heaped it over the little creature who was already asleep. Wild Star was left in the tip of the tallest tree in the forest. There he lay without covering, his face up to the cold sky, his arms flung back above his head, his wings folded tight. He half opened his slumberous eyes on the tree mother as the boat floated away, but before the smile in them faded, he was asleep. There was straight shore, even flying then to Helma's little house, set in its snowy garden, and down they sank to the door stone. The tree mother carried Ivra, who was fast asleep, in her arms. The fire leapt when they entered, until the walls and floor danced with light. The tree mother undressed Ivra, who never once opened her eyes and tucked her into bed. Then she helped Eric, who was fumbling and missing buttons, in a sleepy way. But he was awake enough to kiss her good night, and that was the end of everything until morning. Chapter 8 A Witch at the Window When the children woke the next morning, there was no Helma. Her bed had not been slept in. They had been too sleepy the night before to wonder at her absence, but now they could hardly believe their eyes. The room was strange and lonely without her. The fire had died in the night. They sat up in their beds and talked about it. She always comes back before bedtime, said Ivra. She has never stayed away before. Eric said, perhaps that is why the tree mother brought you in and undressed you. Perhaps she knew our mother had not come back. She looked wise as though she knew everything. She does know everything, at least everything in the forest. But did she bring me in, right here in her arms, Eric, and undressed you while you were sound asleep? Ivra laughed with delight and clasped her hands. Truly, truly, the dear tree mother undressed me. Are you sure? Did she kiss me good night? But suddenly she grew solemn. Yes, she knew that mother was not here. She only takes care of those who have no one else. Well, we will have to wait for mother. That is all. She will surely come this morning. 
But she did not come that morning, nor that day, nor for many days. You shall hear it all. The children laid the fire together, shivering but hopeful. Ivra got the breakfast, teaching Eric, so that next time he could help. They chattered and played a good deal, and really had quite a merry time of it. It was only at first that Ivra was solemn over Helma's disappearance. Soon her good sense told her that Helma loved them both, and nothing could keep her long from her children. After breakfast, they washed and put away the dishes. Then they tidied the room. They hurried over it a little, perhaps, for it was a bright winter day, and all the forest was waiting to be played in. Before they ran out, they put a log on the fire that it took both of them to lift. If Helma should come back while they were away, she must find a warm house. Ivra skipped back after they were outside to set out a bowl and spoon for her and stand the cream jug beside them. Then away they fled, running and jumping in the frosty morning air. Ivra taught Eric some games that could be played by two alone. They were running games, climbing games, hiding games, jumping games. Ivra was swift and strong and unafraid. Her cheeks reddened like apples in the cold. She was a fine playfellow. Not until they were hungry did they think of home. Then they ran hand in hand at last, jumping the garden hedge like deer, their hearts beating with the expectation of running straight into Helma's arms. But no Helma was there. Nora had come with the milk, left it, eaten the rest of the porridge, and gone away again, without waiting for a word with any one. The children wished she had stayed. They needed someone to talk with about their mother. Of course they knew she would come back, all in her good time. Ivra made Eric understand that, but the room seemed even emptier without her than it had in the morning. They cheered each other as best they could, drank a lot of the fresh milk, and ate some nuts. They wanted to get away into the forest again and forget the empty house, so they did not try to cook anything. They played hard all the afternoon. Towards twilight, it grew warmer and began to snow, great wet flakes. They ran home, leaping the hedge again. The house was still empty. Helma was not there. They stirred up the fire and sat down on the floor in front of it to talk over what they should do. Then it happened. The strange, the beautiful, the frightful thing. Eric saw a face at the window. It was so perfectly beautiful, that face, that he wanted to shut his eyes against it. It almost hurt. It was the face of a young woman. Very pale, but when her eyes met Eric's, they filled with dancing laughter. Her hair under her peaked white hood glistened, blue-black, like a river in the snow. She lifted a small white hand and tapped on the window pane, nodding to him merrily. Ivra turned at the sound of the little fingers on the glass. When she saw the face, she started to her feet with a frightened cry, and rushing to the door, drew the bolt. She can't get in, she can't get in. Eric, don't be afraid. We are safe. But the poor little girl did not believe her own words. She was trembling. Why, I'm not afraid, said Eric, running to the window. The merry eyes drew him. Now her mouth danced into smiles. With her eyes, she made pretty signs to him to open the window and let her in. But Ivra pulled him back. 
don't you know, it's the beautiful wicked witch, she whispered. But Eric was impatient. How can she be wicked when she's so beautiful, he exclaimed. He was so little used to people, beautiful people, in his life, that now he was fascinated and delighted. The beautiful wicked witch looked at Ivra then, and Ivra saw how her eyes were dancing. Great black eyes, full of splendor and fun. She caught her breath. She laughed back at the beautiful wicked witch. She could not help herself, but her hands flew to her mouth to stop the laugh. Shut your eyes, Eric. That must be best not to look at her at all. That is what mother did when she came before. She bolted the door, and then we sat down in front of the fire and never looked at the window once, while she told me a long, lovely world story about Psyche and her little playmate, Eros. Then, when we had forgotten all about the beautiful wicked witch, we looked at the window by accident, and she was gone. Come, I'll tell you a world story now, the same one. But Eric hardly heard what she was saying. He moved nearer and nearer to the window. Ivra followed him, charmed by the laughing face there too. Then together they unbolted the window pane and opened it outward. The beautiful wicked witch stepped in. How silly to be afraid of me, children, she laughed. I have only come to play with you. Oh, goody, cried both of the children together, for now that she was in the room, all their fear and wonder had vanished. It was dusk, and so they lighted all the candles and poked the fire before they turned to entertain their guest but the candles did not burn very well, very faintly and flickeringly, and the fire fell lower and lower, instead of growing higher and higher as they nursed it. Don't mind about that, laughed the beautiful wicked witch. There's enough light from the window for us to play together in. We won't bother with the stubborn old fire and the silly little copycat candles. Come, what shall we play? But the children had been playing hard all day, and their bodies were tired. Oh, tell us a story instead of playing, begged Ivra. This is the time when mother tells her very best stories. Well, I am not mother, said the beautiful wicked witch, but I will tell you the best stories I can. Come sit near the window where the light is stronger. That fire will never burn while I am here. I am brighter than it, and the old thing is jealous. The children laughed at her joke, but it was true. She was very bright. Her eyes seemed to light the room, or perhaps it was her gown, like an opal fire, blue and pink and purple, changing and glowing, and made of the softest silk. Ivra nestled close to her knee, where she could stroke the gleaming silk. Eric sprawled on the floor at her feet, his face upturned to hers. Then she told them a story. It was not like any of Helma's world stories, but the children liked it. It was all about a gorgeous bird she had at home in her tree house. She told how she had heard it singing one morning, in early spring, high up in the branches of her tree, and how she had watched it day after day, flying back and forth in the forest, its yellow breast flashing among the green leaves. It had a long golden bill, and its tail was black as jet, and its wings were the softest gray in the world, with a feather of jet in either one. Its song was the clearest the highest, the purest of all the bird songs in the forest. It was a wonderful bird, and she wanted it for her own. Then she told the children 
how she had set traps for it, and how it had escaped every time, but at last she had made a dear little cage, all woven of spring flowers and leaves, and put food in it. Still the bird escaped, pulling the food out with its long bill and never getting inside the door, and finally she told them how she did capture that wild, shy bird by learning its song and singing it sitting in her tree house with the window open until the bird heard and came flying in wonder to find what other bird was calling it then she had closed the window and the bird was hers it hung now in the pretty cage in her prettiest room and sometimes sang in the middle of the night eric liked the story and all the better because it was a true story and the beautiful wicked witch said he could see the bird himself if he would come to her house he could stroke its bright breast and it would sing perhaps then there were other things caged in her house cunning little animals and some big ones worth any boys seeing but Ivra answered for Eric, shaking her head hard. No, no, mother doesn't want us to visit you. But Eric said, May I open the cage door and the window and see the bird flash away? I should like that. No, well, perhaps, said the beautiful wicked witch. Will you come then? I can't, I suppose, if mother Helma doesn't want me to. Are you sure she doesn't, Ivra? Ivra was sure. The beautiful wicked witch laughed then. Of course, if you tell her she won't let you come, but if you came without telling, how could she mind? That sounds true, but some way it can't be, said Ivra, and that seemed to end it. But after a little, the beautiful wicked witch began another story. This one was about a frock she had made, a wonderful thing... all of cobwebs and violet petals, with tiniest rosebuds around the neck. If Ivra were to slip that frock over her head and unbraid her funny little pigtails, she would look as pretty as any fairy in the world. Ivra was not too young to want to be pretty. If she would only go to the beautiful wicked witch's house, she could try on that dress and wear it for one whole day if she liked. Ivra clasped her hands, but then she thought and asked a question. Could I play in it and run and climb? Would I be as free in this little old brown smock? The beautiful wicked witch raised her hands in horror. My cobweb frock, why, it would be ruined. It would be in shreds. How can you even think of treating it so? So Ivra shook her head until her funny little pigtails flopped from side to side. I don't want to wear it then for even a minute. What fun would there be? Well, think about it anyway, said the beautiful wicked witch, and rose to go away. It's the fur, you know, beyond the white birch. Thank you for the stories, said the children. Goodbye, said the beautiful wicked witch. Perhaps Eric will remember and come. It's a gorgeous bird, and I haven't said he couldn't free it. Then she slipped out into the snowflakes, turning to give them one dancing look over her shoulder before the door swung to. Up flamed the candles, clear high flames when she was gone, and the fire crackled again and took on new life reaching higher and higher. They got their supper together rather silently, but just before going to sleep, Ivra roused herself to say, let's promise each other we won't go to the beautiful wicked witch's fur until mother comes home, and we can tell her how jolly the witch is and what good stories she told us. I don't want to go anyway, answered Eric, unless I can free the bird. But you see, he had not promised. 
After a while, did you notice how pale her face was when she wasn't laughing? Asked Eric. Yes, and not so beautiful then. Mother may come in the night, and we never know, won't know till morning. Soon they were asleep, a tired but happy little girl and boy. I think the tree mother sank down in her airboat to look in at them and open the door wide, which they had forgotten, so they would have fresh air all night, but it was dark, and the room was shadowy, so perhaps it was only the wind.